I don't want to interrupt the interesting conversations that are going on because I'm sure there's absolutely lots of them. However, we do have our next speaker. I'd like to introduce Nick Jones. Now, Nick Jones started his um, crypto business Zumo in, here in Scotland. So first of all, fantastic for that. Uh, Zumo's mission is to provide a better planet for digital assets, delivering sustainable and accessible secure ways to unlock the benefits of Web3. Uh, they do this providing infrastructure that allows fintech banks, asset managers and brands to offer the customers access to digital assets in a secure and adaptable way. I'm delighted to welcome Nick from Zumo. Thank you. Thank you and hi everyone. I'm going to try and keep this quite brief because Erica's got all the juicy stuff on uh, what's gone wrong in crypto over the last few years. So I want to make sure she's got enough time. To, uh, to give you the inside scoop, you're going to give the inside scoop on what FTX, uh, all of them, Celsius, uh, <laughs> Voyager, all of the stuff, no. Um, yeah, so I was asked by um, Jason, who's not here, unfortunately, um, just to give you a bit of a flavor of the kind of the founder journey uh, in Scotland, launching a crypto and blockchain business in Scotland and how that's been for us. Um, so I don't know if you want to roll on to the next slide so people don't have to look at a big photograph of me, uh, which is better. Um, so yeah, we're just coming up to our fifth birthday, we, uh, July 2018. We actually started the company in at the end of 2017 and we built um, a smart contracts exchange platform on Solidity, which is the programming language which underpins Ethereum. Really, really cool smart contracts exchange platform where all the trades were settled by independent oracles we were really like, we thought we'd really cracked it. And we did an MVP for the World Cup in 2018 where you could, people could wager peer to peer against each other and all the bets were settled um, by the oracles. And we sent out the onboarding information to hundreds of our friends and about five people onboarded because it included a 10 page user manual on how to buy Ethereum, what MetaMask was, what crypto was, <laughs> the fact that it wasn't all a scam, all the usability issues that we still find with. Um, uh, with DeFi and with the space, both reputational and, 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 um, and real issues, which have kind of waxed and waned over that period. I mean, I think last year, uh, Iona referenced it, I think we had three Black Swan events last year. I'm getting nervous, actually, because we haven't had one in the last three months. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to find some wood, find some wood to touch. But, um, you know, it, it's, been, it's been an interesting journey. Zumo's my... Zumo is my third, um, my third uh, business as a, as a founder. Done two fairly boring uh, businesses in B2B, uh, in fairly kind of safe spaces, one in digital marketing. We actually built one of the first Facebook ad management platforms, boo. Uh, <laughs> and then we built a data analytics business, which um, pulled in all the naughty data that you could get from Facebook. And my, my interest in blockchain, really, in blockchain, I would say, came from the whole data sovereignty, people-powered internet, um, putting the power back in the hands of, uh, of individuals and, and the disruptive nature of that, not just in financial services, which we look at through crypto, but broadly in, in all sorts of areas, um, uh, uh, you know, ID, for example, being a, being a key one. So, yeah, we, we um, I don't know if we want to jump onto the next slide, actually, because that's the timeline. I can, I can no, ju just, just jump onto the next one and we can remember... I can actually make me remember what happened. So, yeah, 2018, we built this, um, this really cool product. If anybody wants to buy, <laughs> if anybody wants to buy a really cool smart contracts exchange platform on Solidity, we have one on the shelf ready to go. If anybody, if anybody wants it, it's all there, it's ready to rock. If anybody here is in the gaming industry or in, or in derivatives, come, come and see me afterwards. It's all there ready to go. But we decided to pivot because we couldn't get anybody on, onto it and use it. It was too difficult. So we decided to um, build a non-custodial wallet infrastructure, um, which would be chain agnostic. So we started with Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, the two big ones. And we built it um, as an SDK, a software development kit, an API, more kind of jargon, but we built it as a piece of software that other developers could pick up and build into their platforms. Because we knew uh, that our only option was to send people a five page PDF on how to use MetaMask, which was not a particularly great user experience. We were probably about five years early. Um, so we, uh, so we, we decided that the best way of proving the use case of that was to build our own app. So we decided to build, um, we decided to build out um, Zumo into an application 
um, which was built around non-custodial wallets. We believe in decentralization, as Iona was saying. We believe in um, you know, on-chain assets. But we also decided that the direction of travel was going to be regulation. Um, so there are many times over the last five years that um, I've felt we felt like um, we've been on the wrong side of that argument or that we've been particularly masochistic in deciding to go down the regulated route. And we spent a very, very, very long time, about 18 months, um, trying to explain to the FCA um, what a non-custodial wallet was. In fact, on the day before we received our letter of authorization, we had a call with a very senior team at the FCA um, where, some, where they asked us, we're happy to proceed, but we need you to provide all of your wallet addresses to the company. Um, and we had to explain to them again that we didn't hold any funds ourselves on the platform, it was non-custodial. So we've been through this, this journey, which is not really actually knocking, it sounds like it's knocking the FCA, but actually it's, it's really speaking to this very sharp um, learning and educational curve that everybody's had to go on um, in this space, um, which has been hindered and helped. It's been helped by bull runs. It's been helped by the excitement of institutional investors piling money into it, retail investors piling into it, the perceived successes of people like FTX and Celsius. And it's been hindered by the usual kind of array whenever you get uh, new technology of bad actors, um, badly run businesses, which kind of then pull things down reputationally. And interestingly enough, and I hope this isn't being shared publicly, but <laughs> FTX was being run on Google Sheets because they didn't believe that there was accountancy software out there that could fulfill their needs, supposedly. And a couple of the other uh, high profile businesses that failed were being run off, run off a kind of set of Google Sheets, which as anybody with any kind of accountancy financial background will know is a, a recipe for money disappearing out the back door on apartment blocks in Bahamas and and other, th and other things like that. So it's been an incredibly interesting journey. I think it's three crypto winters that we've now weathered the storm on. Um, as I say, black swan events we've kind of um, lost, um, lost track of, but we, we've really focused on a, a few things. So one was building out incredibly strong technology. So our non-custodial wallets have um, a number of patents associated with them. We believe they're the most secure way of storing, of storing crypto. Um, and then we have built out an infrastructure around those to include a, um, a custody management solution, an exchange management solution, and all of which, whilst we built them all for our own app, which we've gone through this FCA registration process with, all the while we've been thinking, I mean, be building on the basis that we would license that technology out to other people. And really, um, there's, in, there's some kind of basic economic reasons for that, because none of the kind of consumer crypto bank account type apps, uh, apps work financially. You can't get the unit, unit economics to work. We believe that at the moment, crypto as an investment product works best alongside things like stocks, shares, um, alternative investments of many kinds. So we, we've built a stack which allows share trading companies, savings companies, investment companies, banks, neobanks to add crypto to their platform in a really compliant way through a set of very, very easy to consume APIs. We spent the last year, uh, the last year building that out and, uh, and making sure that's being done in a compliant way. And then we believe we're the only business that has the FCA's blessing to be able to do that and to help people launch crypto businesses, launch crypto functionality in the UK without having to go through or whilst going through the very arduous um, <laughs> UK uh, regulation process, which is a good thing. Consumer protection is a good thing overreach of um, regulation into areas that, that, that it really understand is not such a good thing. And it's a bit the same with traditional financial markets, as Iona was saying. Right? Nobody understands how traditional financial markets work, not even the people that work in them, really. They might understand their, their little bit of it. And nobody understands how their television works, apart from a very few TV engineers, and no one understands how their mobile phone works. It's about the outcomes. For our industry, it's going to be much better when people focus on what it does rather than how it works. No one in their right mind gives a shit what blockchain something's on, as long as it's one that actually works properly and has some provenance around it. It's what are the outcomes? What does it do for people? Does it lower the cost of remittances? Does it make things more secure? Does it offer you the chance to earn some yield by lending against those assets? Um, does it reform your back and middle office processes if you're a bank? There's all sorts of uses um, for, this, for this amazing um, blockchain technology and I think probably one of the one of the positives that's coming out of this last kind of the end of the last crypto hype cycle 
is that institutional investors haven't run away in the same way as they did in 2017. Institutional investors have embraced the space, and most of the big banks are using blockchain somewhere on the back end, whether it's for FX, um, whether it's for settlement internally, and it's because technology is really, 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 really good. It makes a massive amount of sense. You cut loads of middlemen out of, every, out of any transaction, and that is, that is a good thing. Um, you know, that is a good thing for, every, for, for everybody. Um, so along the way, yeah, we, we built the app up to about 60,000 users in the UK. We got, the, um, we got uh, FCA regulated. And then we kind of worked out it wasn't going to work um, financially. We kind of saw under the hood of a couple of the aforementioned uh, players and what they were doing to monetize their users and decided that we didn't want to go down that route. So we pivoted into being this pure B2B play, um, which we spent the last year working on. Now launched the Zemo Enterprise. And, and it's really been a, a, an interesting time to do it because most people, I would say, across the sector are using this, and it is a cliche, but building in a bear market. We're seeing massive amounts of building going across the traditional financial services sector, crypto companies, uh, asset managers, banks. They're all looking at ways that they're, that they're going to leverage blockchain and crypto in the next wave of adoption. And that might be retail crypto. It might be, as Iona said, tokenization in whatever way, shape or form of that. We're big believers in tokenization of private assets. I think that's an amazing democratization of finance. I'm, I don't really see the use case for tokenizing shares. You can buy shares. What's the point? But being able to tokenize commercial property, for example, or wine or music rights, uh, that is super interesting because unless you're a private equity fund, you can't invest in those things. Even tokenizing investing into private equity funds. That kind of stuff is super interesting and probably a bit easier for most people to understand than a purely algorithmically set um, uh, cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, even though Ian explained it really, really clearly. It's still, it's still exceptionally difficult for, for, for most people to understand. Um, so yeah, that's been, that's been our journey. I, think, I guess the other thing to comment on, the other thing that's been interesting uh, for us, I'm sorry, I'll just touch on one other thing that, that Iona said amongst this DeFi bit. So I like to think of myself as relatively technically savvy, and I did a lot of research on DAOs and decided to invest some money into a DAO uh, last year. <coughs> it's not an insignificant amount of money, not six figures, but not, mu not much short of. And I pushed a button in MetaMask to send it rather than pushing the pull button from the DAO. And I was very, very glad that I have one of the world's top Ethereum engineers on my team to help me find the, uh, the money that went missing along the way. So this stuff is not, uh, is not easy. None of this stuff is easy. It's very, very complex. Um, probably the other thing that we've, that, we've, um, that we've built around over the last couple of years has been around um, decarbonization. So lots of uh, noise and chat in the market around Bitcoin in particular and Bitcoin's carbon footprint. How much electricity does Bitcoin use? It uses a lot, it's not very efficient, but the beauty about Bitcoin is, and this is in very simplistic terms, you can decarbonize it because it's, there's no supply chain, it's just electricity. So you can buy renewable energy certificates and you can decarbonize your, your Bitcoin piece. So it's, it's, it's turned into a massively important product for us as we engage with tier one financial institutions for our customers, that they know that they can kind of hand on heart hold by Bitcoin and it aligns with their broader ESG green investment principles. It's been a huge, huge driver for us. And I like to say we are kind of global market leaders on, uh, on, on that space. And it's, and it's enabled us to establish this, um, this position. So I'm just going to finish off, I think, um, a couple of bits on the journey. It's really hard trying to do this from Scotland, but it's not impossible. You just have to go and look for the money somewhere else because you're not going to raise it here. Um, but the world's, <laughs> the, world's not that, the world's not that big, so you, you can go elsewhere. Just I'd probably save yourself the, um, the time and effort, although there are some enlightened individuals, one or two of whom are in the room. <laughs> there's, not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of interest in the space yet, so it's about building some of these success stories and, and, and communicating them and hopefully re recycling some entrepreneurs who've made some money, money in the space. The flip side is excellent support from the Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise, Fintech Scotland. Hopefully this new gathering today helps drive that forward. And it's not very far to London and it's not very far to Berlin and it's not very far to Abu Dhabi.
So it's it's you just have to kind of get over yourself and get on with it. And hopefully, hopefully the investment community here catches up. Um, and then finally, yeah, just on some trends, which I just to touch on briefly, because everybody always asks what's going to happen. I will give no form of price prediction on any form of cryptocurrency. I must ask that about 100 times a day. But the big things that we see coming up, so tokenization of private assets, it's coming, it's happening already, and that will become a big thing. And, and that will be something that all of us are able to add to our investment portfolios in the same way as ultra high net worths, private equity funds, banks do. Alternative investments will be enabled by blockchain. Stable coins aren't going anywhere. They're going to live alongside CBDCs, and that's because most stable coins outside of places where they're going to be used for surveillance uh, are going to be wholesale, institutionally focused, not retail. Um, we're just starting to see blockchain realizing its potential and, and, and big companies understanding where that is, and that's going to, and that's going to drive the space. And, and, and crypto, well, look, I agree again with, with Iona. I think that the real disruption in crypto and DeFi comes in um, comes out with the developed world. It comes in low, middle income countries where, um, you know, there's, there's some really, really real use cases. And the thing, the thing I would say to keep our eye on, another boring one, but keep your eye on the travel rule and what happens with the interference that we're likely to get in freedom of movement of crypto um, uh, on that note. But I think there's massive amounts to be positive in. There's some incredible building going on in this bear market at the moment. I uh, like some really amazing building and it's great to see so many people in Scotland. Uh, with the same kind of ideas. Thanks a lot.